Let me thank all of you for coming. Let me thank the Green Mountain Community Chorus for their music. And they're going to return in a little while. Uh, you know, before COVID, uh, we used to do these things on an annual basis, not only here in Burlington, but all over the state. Uh, and it was very important for us to bring people together and to have a nice time. Uh, but COVID put a damper on that, obviously. Uh, so we're glad to be back again. We thank the Hilton here for their help in arranging this. Uh, what I wanted to do is just chat for a few minutes about what's going on in Washington. Uh, then I'm going to stop and take your questions and your comments. But before I even begin, let me mention to you that we have an office located here in Burlington, the 1-800 number, that really does a very, very good job in helping Vermonters with their problems, whether it's Social Security, veterans, Medicare, Medicaid, whatever it may be, housing, we do our best, and we have some really good staff. So if you or anybody you know, family, friends, has a problem, do not hesitate to give us a ring. Uh, that's what we are there for. Uh, right now, as all of you know, a lot of our staff is focused on the terrible flooding that we experienced a number of weeks ago. Uh, it was the worst natural disaster in our state since 1927. Uh, 4,000 homes were damaged. Some of them are not going to be rebuilt. I was in Barrie uh, after the flood. It was just terrible. Just terrible what the flood did there and in other places. Montpelier downtown, very bad. Uh, Londonderry, etc. A lot of towns were hit very, very hard. So we're working right now uh, to try to bring in the disaster relief money uh, that the state needs, working with the governor and others and the delegation to make that happen. So that is uppermost on our minds. But obviously what we are dealing with in Washington, and so all of you know, uh, is not just the flood. Uh, I think it is fair to say uh, that the moment in which we are living in today uh, might be the most difficult, challenging moment in our lifetimes. Um, you know, the 1930s, some of you may have been uh, around then, uh, was terrible, was the Depression, unemployment was high. Obviously, the Civil War back in the 1860s was terrible, etc. But this is a difficult, difficult moment in American history. And what are some of the issues that we're dealing with and what is Washington doing or not doing uh, too often it is not doing to address them? Issue number one, if anybody in this room gets hooked on Fox TV <laughs> and thinks that climate change is not real, you are terribly, terribly mistaken. Uh, right now, um, we are living in a moment where the last eight years have been the warmest on record. Just, just this last July, last month, warmest July in recorded history. July 4th was the warmest day ever recorded on Earth. And it's not just the United States. China had a temperature of 123 degrees. They had flooding, which drove a million people out of the Beijing area. Iran literally had to shut down its country. People couldn't go to work. It was so hot. Latin America, Africa, you name it. Right now, we're dealing probably still with the forest fires in Quebec. Remember breathing in that lovely air? It was really disgusting. I was in Washington at the worst of it. And this forest fire, the smoke from the forest fire, went all over many parts of the country and created the worst air days that people had ever seen. We were in Washington, and I went out for a walk. You, you, know, you, you were breathing in this horrible, horrible air. Absolutely awful. People got sick from that. And I don't have to tell anybody, not only what happened in Vermont last month, what happened, the terrible death toll that we're seeing in Maui, uh, in Hawaii, where you're just a beautiful, beautiful island which has suffered devastating uh, fires, uh, which essentially are caused by what climate change is doing. 
So this is a problem that has to be dealt with. Is Congress doing much to deal with it? We're doing something. Right? Last year, in a bill called the Inflation Adjustment Act, we put hundreds of billions of dollars into energy efficiency and sustainable energy. One of the provisions that I got in will make it easier for middle class, working class, lower income people to put solar panels on their rooftops. How many people here have solar rooftop, have solar panels? All right. You're saving a lot of money on your electric bill, right? All right? So a lot of people don't know. They say, well, solar is good. It's good for the climate. It cuts pollution. That's true. But you know what else it does? It saves substantial sums of money. Jane and I put solar on our house about seven years ago, I think. Our electric bill went down by 80%, which is about average, OK? Now, the problem is that a lot of people can't afford the initial upfront investment for the solar, which you know, depends on tax credits and how, like, how big your house is. We spent, I think, about 14000 15000 bucks. So what this bill does is either provides grants or loans to people to put the solar on, and if they, if they have to repay the loan, it will not be any more than their current electric bill. So if you're paying 100 bucks now, you pay 100 bucks to repay the loan, and at the end of seven, eight, nine years, that's it, you own the solars, and you get virtually free electricity. So this is what we're trying to do all over the country. And solar and energy efficiency, investing in energy efficiency, something we saw here in this city when I was mayor. We did some bond issues, people supported it. I'm sure it's changed a little bit, but for a number of years uh, in the city of Burlington, while the city grew, the city department, electric co-op, was not using any more electricity because of energy efficiency. So those are the two directions we have moving into wind, solar, and other renewable energies, and making sure that what we do is more energy efficient. So that's issue number one. Issue number two that we're dealing with, I am now the chairman of a committee in the Senate called the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, which is a big deal. It's a big committee. And one of the issues we are tackling is the high cost of prescription drugs. Now, an issue. We are taking on the pharmaceutical industry, which is an industry of incredible greed. These guys want everything. They are charging us in this country the highest prices in the world by far for prescription drugs. Some of you may recall that a number of years ago, many years ago now, when I was at the conference actually, I took a trip from St. Albans over to Montreal to help women who were dealing with breast cancer. They needed a drug called Tamoxifen still used. They bought that drug in Montreal for one-tenth of the price they had to pay in Vermont. One-tenth of the price. And a couple of years ago, I went from Detroit, Michigan, to Windsor, Ontario. Same deal. There was a lot of people buying insulin products. Insulin, big deal, because we have a major crisis in diabetes. They pay one-tenth of the price. So we are working hard to take on the pharmaceutical industry, lower the cost of prescription. Not easy. They are a very, very powerful industry that owns a lot of members in Congress. Last session, we had some success. If you're on Medicare, it will kick in. You should not have to pay more than $35 a month for insulin. All right, that's a step forward. More importantly, within a short period of time, I can't remember, the next year, two years, and this is a big deal. No senior in America will have to pay more than $2,000 out-of-pocket costs. All right, so if you have, if right now you're taking a lot of medicine, that will be a big time. Third issue, which of course the pharmaceutical industry is running to the courts to get overturned, is maybe the most important. The reason we pay the highest prices in the world is there have never been regulations on the industry. So they come up with a drug, or they have a drug, maybe it's been out there for 20 years, and they say, hey, 
Guess what? We even messed up all the price. Well, no, no, let's triple the price. What's the difference? No one stops us. It's not against the law. And that's what they do. So you got drugs been on the market for a long period of time. They just double, triple, they get what the market can bear. So for the very first time, what Medicare will do in a couple of years is negotiate prices with the pharmaceutical industry. Starting off small, only 10 drugs, why do you use drugs? So in other words, the pharmaceutical industry will not be able to charge any price they want. This is something that the Veterans Administration has been doing for decades and doing it well, which is why the VA pays by far the lowest prices in this country for prescription drugs. So, I'm going to be introducing a bill. I don't know that it will get passed because of all the opposition from the industry and people get paid by the industry. But basically, what it will say is kind of doing what the Canadians do. You're going to look around the world, look at what goes on in Europe, look at what goes on in Japan, and in the United States, we will not pay more than the average cost of those drugs all over the world. That would lower prescription drug costs by 50%. The other issue that we're working on, on the committee, and we're working on it, literally, my staff is working on it, literally, as I stand here. And that is, I don't have to tell anybody that the healthcare system in America is broken. Is that true? Okay. What does that mean? And I want to go through what broken means and what I believe the alternatives are. Number one. We spend as a nation, who wants to help me out here? Guess how much we spend per person, every man, woman, and child in America on health care. What's the guess? $13,000 a year per person. You got that? Now that includes Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, what your employer pays you, what people pay out of pocket. Okay? It includes all of that. Add it all together. And divide it up by the 320 million people in America, it turns out it was spending $13,000 each person. That is double what any other country on Earth spends. Double what our friends 50 miles north of us spend. Why is it that we spend so much? What's the function of the current health care system? You got it. The function of the current healthcare system is not to provide quality care to all people. That should be the function. The function is to make as much money as possible for the insurance companies and the drug companies. And that is exactly what is happening right now. At the end of the day, in my view, and it's going to take a, a, just a massive effort to make it happen, we got to move in the direction what Europe does, what Canada does. If you get sick in Canada, and their system is not perfect, I'm not here to tell you it is, but if you get sick in Canada and you end up in the hospital for four weeks, how much is the bill when you get out? Anyone know? Zero. 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 You walk into a doctor's office, how much do you pay? Zero. Okay. And they cover every man, woman, and child in their country in our country, we've got 85 million people who are uninsured or underinsured. They do that for half the cost per person that we pay. Now here's where the, here's where the, the problem lies. When I propose what we call a Medicare for All system, there are 37 ads on television saying, Bernie Sanders wants to raise your taxes. Okay? And to some degree, that's true. On the other hand, what Bernie wants to do is eliminate all of your premiums, your co-payments, your deductibles. So if you have to pay, if you have to pay, hypothetically, $5,000 more a year in taxes, and you save $10,000 a year in out-of-pocket and insurance costs, seems to me like you're 5000 to the good. Okay? So, that's the ultimate fight. 
But we're taking on the drug companies, the insurance companies, a lot of powerful people to make that happen. And it's not going to happen tomorrow. But I am trying now to do something in a smaller way, at least, working really hard trying to get bipartisan support, and that is to expand primary health care in America. What does that mean? It means that other countries around the world invest 10-15% of their health care dollars in primary health care. Primary health care means that everybody has the opportunity to walk into a doctor's office when you are sick, walk into a dental office. Dental care an issue? Yes. Go into a dentist when you need to. Now, what is the advantage of that? Well, the obvious advantage is when people are sick, they should be able to find the doctor. But for the system, the truth is, we save money when you are able to go to a doctor when you are sick. Why? Because if you don't have a doctor, you're going to go to the emergency room, which is the most expensive form of primary health care. And furthermore, if you don't have any money, you get really sick, what ends up happening? You end up in the hospital, which is outrageously expensive. So keeping people healthy, keeping people healthy is not only the right thing to do from a humane point of view, it saves the system money. So I'm trying to significantly increase funding for primary care so we can keep people out of the hospital, of which I do. The other issue, The other issue um, related to that is that despite the fact that we spend so much on health care, literally speaking, we don't have enough doctors in America, we don't have enough nurses in America, we don't have enough mental health providers. Mental health is a huge issue in this country right now. We don't have enough dentists in America. We don't have pharmacists in America. So we have to grow the healthcare workforce, something that we are working uh, very, very hard on. So those are some of the issues uh, that I'm touching on. Let me just touch on a, a few others on the local side. I want you to be thinking about this, because you're looking at probably the only member in the Congress who talks about it, but it needs to be talked about. <laughs> All right, well, 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 what's that? All right. What, one of the things that concerns me is that you live in a nation right now where some 60% of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. You all know what that means? You do know what it means. Unfortunately, you do know what it means. It means that you have to pay rent, you have to buy food, you have to go to the doctor's office, and at the end of the week, you got nothing saved. Sometimes people are falling further behind. Why is that? Cost of housing in America is skyrocketing. Childcare, very expensive. Gasoline at the pump, expensive. Doctor's appointments, very, very expensive. So you got all those costs, but wages for the average American have not kept up with that inflation. In fact, this is an amazing fact I want you to think about. And that is over the last 50 years, real inflation accounted for wages. You know what that means? That means, that means wages that take inflation into consideration. Real wages for American workers have virtually not gone up at all. Got that? So you got all of the technology, all of the computers. You know, when I was mayor of Burlington in the 80s, but I walked into the city hall, they didn't have any computers. Cell phones did not exist. So you have all of this new technology, and yet the average worker in America is no better off than he or she was 50 years ago. On the other hand, the people on top are doing phenomenally well. So you've got more income and wealth inequality today than we have ever had in the history of America. Now, very few people talk about it. I talk about it. Because to me, it is not moral and it is not good economics that three people on top, Elon Musk and a few of his friends, own more wealth than the bottom half of American society. Got that? Three people. 
Almost all of the new income goes to the people on top. So our struggle ultimately is to try to create an economy that works for everybody, not just the billionaires and the 1%. More what do you think the billionaires do with their money? They invest it in government. So right now, as a result of a Supreme Court decision called Citizens United, you all hear that? Listen. What that decision, what the Supreme Court said is, for all of you who are billionaires, and I know we've got many billionaires in this room right now, you can spend hundreds of millions of dollars. Nobody knows it. Go to the bank, take out a couple hundred million dollars, put it into a super PAC. Citizens for good government. And then you run ads on television attacking people who are trying to stand up for working people, supporting other people. You can control the political process. So we need real campaign finance reform to make sure that billionaires are all on the So those are some of the issues, and they are weighty and difficult issues. There are many, many other issues on your mind. Those are some of the issues that we are dealing with uh, right now. Um, all right, let me conclude by just saying what I said in the beginning. If you have any personal issues, where's the set? Haley is right here. Um, Ryan is right here. Raise your hand, Ryan. Where else? Hannah, Kate is here. Hannah is over there. Uh, we've got staff right here. We'll just give us your phone number, and we will get back to you if there are any personal issues you want us to do with. Okay, let's open it up. Any questions? Uh, who has the mic? Kate, okay. you got it? How many mics do we have? We have to How many? This one, I'll, get, I'll take that one. Okay. Is this on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. My name is Joe Patrice, I'm a retired state employee. Uh, I didn't know this until last fall, but what I'm about to say is something you can do something about because it has nothing to do with Congress. It's about Medicare. So last fall, um, the governor of the state tried to unilaterally impose upon retired state employees a Medicare advantage. He fought the governor, and uh, he was trying to bypass the union, but the legislature stepped in. All things are good right now. We're bargaining for what we have, which is a nonprofit Blue Cross Blue Shield Medicare policy. In the process, I found out that under the Trump administration, traditional Medicare, not Medicare Advantage, was beginning to be privatized through the innovations program called Direct Contract. And it's continuing under the Biden administration. And according to I gave to you, which you can read by the Physicians National Healthcare Program Group. The Biden administration bureaucrats are planning to expand the privatization of traditional Medicare over the next two to eight years. This means they're giving money to direct contracting entities, which is capitated so that Medicare enrollees will, with their providers will be. Right, Joe, you're touching on my pension. Okay. Right, you're touching on a very important issue. And that is, Medicare traditionally has been enormously popular and enormously successful. Has its problems, but it's a very strong program. Over the last number of years, United Insurance and other big insurance companies essentially want to privatize Medicare the same way these guys want to privatize Social Security and Medicaid and everything else. So you're right, it is a very serious problem. It's not within the jurisdiction of my committee, it's another committee. But we do understand it, and it's something that has to be you. I do share your sense. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm here from Burlington, Vermont. I've supported you over the years. I understand you were mayor, and you're always a little guy, and you're always looking out for me. The thing I have a concern about is Social Security. Social Security this year, I believe, is capped at $160,000. After $160,000, you pay most Social Security. Now, me, Elon Musk, and all those cronies, the billionaires, the ball players, the football players, baseball players, the people in Hollywood, everybody, 
They don't pay any Social Security after $160,000. Right. Now, my suggestion is, instead of putting a cap every year on Social Security at the beginning, put it on the end. On the end, at most you could get, well, let's say, $5,000. But pay Social Security on what you earn, and you will have never have a problem with Social Security. <laughs> what is your name? Fred Dieselbach. Fred Dieselbach. Fred. Well, Fred, guess what? I introduced that legislation. Our, our friend is saying it is exactly what. Our, here's the scandal. I want to take two minutes on this. You got a trust fund. Trust fund means the money that Social Security accumulates over there, puts in the bank, so to speak. And what people say, which is true, is that at a certain period, that trust fund is going to disappear. So number one, though, when that trust fund disappears, does it mean that Social Security is going broke? It means the trust fund, the savings is going to disappear. 75, 80% of the money that goes out comes in from workers today. All right, people are working. Okay? Social Security, that money comes in, it goes out to hold the people. That's number one. But the Social Security trust fund is shrinking. We have to deal with it. Now, what Fred says is exactly correct. Here is the scandal. The scandal is you make $160,000 a year. You pay whatever it is, 6% into Social Security. I don't know if that's the exact one. If you make $160 billion a year, you pay the same amount. So what our legislation does, it has a lot of support, is it lifts what's called what we call lifts the cap, gets rid of that cap at 160 taxes people on all of their income, which will impact, not impact the bottom 98%, just the top one or 2%. It will bring in enough money, A, to make Social Security solvent for 75 years, your kids and grandchildren. And number two, it will increase Social Security Benefits. All right? Because right now there are a lot of seniors trying to get by on fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars a year of social security. Is that right? And that's tough to do. So we want to increase that. So Fred has it 100 percent right. That's a bill that I've introduced. We have a number of co-sponsors on it, we're gonna fight for it. That is the solution to the social security problem. Hey, brother. Uh, we have an issue with cost of living adjustments here. Uh, every October 1st, uh, when the new federal budget year starts, we get a cost of living adjustment for those of us who get SNAP benefits, which is probably quite a few of us. Um, and then on January 1st, we get a COLA for our Social Security. The state immediately recalculates our SNAP benefits and they go down 40 to 60 percent. So there goes the big chunk of our Social Security goal, it vanishes, yep. it just disappears. How can we decouple these two things? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, what the, federal, what the governments do, if it's local, state, federal government, they all need money. But instead of going to the place where you should be going, to the people who have the money, they go to people who are short. That is a bad way to raise money. You're on snap. You know, you should not be forced to pay more because you uh, got a social security check. Your social security should not be reduced. So you're absolutely right. I'll give you another example of how that works. Same principle. Right now, you are a low-income single mom, and you're getting benefits for child care. Well, you know what? You get a decent job and make a little bit more money, you can lose those child care benefits. It's the same thing. We're penalizing poor people for trying to survive, lower income people, and that's wrong. Okay, Katie. My name is John Schneider. I'm here with my lovely bride, Marianne. Um, we're both Social Security recipients. We also pay Medicare out of that Social Security. The issue that we have is that when we were employed and had health insurance, uh, that health insurance premiums that we paid were not counted for taxes out of our income. But when you, with Medicare, taken out of Social Security, 
that those premiums we pay for Medicare and also for supplemental is taxed. And that's not fair to people who are on Social Security. So I don't understand why the government is taxing those premiums, basically, that we pay. Well, the answer is it's easy to tax low-income and working people and billionaires. That's the answer. I mean, all of these questions get to the same point. You talk about tax policy. Is that what you're talking about? All right. Give me an example. Piece of the paper yesterday. Pharmaceutical industry, which makes huge profits. What they do is they take their profits, they put them in Europe, where the tax rate is lower, and they pay very little taxes in the United States. Elon Musk probably plays a lower effective tax rate than you do. So it is always, when you go and you fill up your gas tank, it is a regressive form of taxation. So what we're trying to do is to fight for progressive taxation. That means if you've got a lot of money, you should be asked to pay your fair share of taxes. That does not exist right now. That touches on exactly what you're talking about. So your point is well taken. Just as this gentleman's point is well taken. You don't go after low-income or middle-income people and raise their taxes or put more of a burden on them. You go after the people who are doing phenomenally well, the large corporations, who are enjoying record-breaking profits. Okay. Over here, Senator. Where are you? Here you are. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Senator.
Anybody have any idea, if you were in Norway or Denmark and you had a baby, what benefits do you get? Does anybody know? It depends on the country, but you can get up to a year off to stay home with full pay or three quarters pay. Got that? You got vacation time throughout Europe. People are guaranteed 30 days, 40 days of paid vacation. So we are behind many of other countries, and we're trying to do what we can. Any easy. Okay, other questions? Question to you, right? Okay, well, I'm done. Hi, Senator. My name is Bernie Carter. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for all the good ideas and Thank you. My question is, uh, what do you think we can do to restore legitimacy to our Supreme Court? Sad to say, I think most of you know to be the case, is we are living in a very politicized country, and part of that politicization is the Supreme Court. The theory of the Supreme Court is that you put politics aside, you look at the Constitution, the laws of America, and you render the best decision that you can. I don't think too many Americans think that that is now the case. You have a very right-wing Supreme Court, which has passed some terrible, terrible, made some very, very terrible decisions in recent years. I mentioned earlier the Citizens United, which is going a long way to undermine American democracy. Recently, some of all of you know that there was this Dobbs decision, uh, which did away with Roe v. Wade, the right for women to be able to control their own bodies. There are other decisions that come down the pipe that are pro-corporate, anti-worker, and so forth. So it is a tough one, but I think there are ways to do that. Supreme, if you're on the Supreme Court, you're not necessarily guaranteed a lifetime appointment on that court. You are guaranteed a lifetime judiciary appointment according to the Constitution, but there are scholars who think you can rotate people off of the Supreme Court and put them into other federal courts. It might be a good way to do it. But it is a very, very important issue. Because every single issue that we're trying to deal with, you're going to have people running to the Supreme Court getting that overturned. So it's a big deal. Yeah? Hello, Bernie. My name is Hank Prince. I live in New York. And um, I share your frustration about virtually every one of these issues. And I see the absolute root to all of it, as you pointed out, is to overturn Citizens United. Unfortunately, we are far, far away from getting there. Um, I have been working for several years to try and get constitutional amendments to overturn Citizens United through the state legislature method of amending the Constitution. That has failed up to this point. Vermont was the first state to volunteer to do that. Um, and I'm proud of that. But that, together with the lack of excess profits taxes in this country that allow yep. millionaires to become trillionaires, um, we've all worked hard on all these issues, uh, following your great example of leadership. But what can we do today to overturn Citizens United and get an excess profits tax? Because we'll be there to help you Good. if you lead the way. And we are, well, it's not just me. There are other people who are working really hard on that. Another issue, not unrelated to what you're talking about, is the use of the filibuster uh, in the Senate. I mean, people like Senator Berkeley of Oregon are working very hard on that. I'm working with them. Um, all right, what you should know, and I'm sure you do know, is that a few years ago we brought legislation to the floor, which essentially would have overturned Citizens United. You got zero Republican support for that, and we lost two, I think it was two corporate Democrats, a man should have said and we couldn't pass it. But the American, it's an interesting point, because I think no matter what your politics may be, nobody or very few people think it is appropriate 
that billionaires should be able to control the democratic process. So we have the support of the people behind us. I think we've got to elect people to Congress who are prepared to pass legislation which essentially does away with Citizens United. And I would even go further, I'll tell you what I would do. I believe in some communities, some states in moving in this direction, is to have public funding of elections. In other words, what that means, what that means is, you know, if I call up some billionaire and the guy's gonna send me all kinds of money, it's very hard to defeat me. But if you have a limits on how much people can spend, that's doing away with Citizens United, and then saying, let's see you're a working class person, you're not a lot of money. You have some good ideas, you want to run for office, how are you gonna get the money you need? Where you do public funding of elections, if you have a certain threshold, you can help, and you can run a serious campaign. There are states that do that. Maine does some of that, for example. So you're, you're absolutely right. This issue of campaign finance reform, election reform, gerrymandering reform, enormously important. I hope people stay tuned and pay attention to those issues. Okay, a couple of more questions. I got one right here. Oh, Senator in the back, and I'll go. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I got the BA for insurance, thank God, and I also got Medicare. I know you push Medicare, but uh, I have to cancel Part B because I can't afford the uh, premium. Uh, that's one issue. The second issue is what can you do about the uh, crime, the drug use, and the homelessness in Burlington? Um, well, that's a good, good question. Um, all I would say is, you know, it's, it's an issue I'm sure the mayor and the city council are attempting to deal with. I will tell you that the issue of homelessness is a huge issue in this state, not, not only here in Burlington, but around the state. I get around the state. And if you talk to police officers, you talk to teachers, you talk to local officials, just on a route or the other day, homelessness and the high cost of housing is a major, major issue. And when you have homelessness and you have drug addiction, you're gonna have crime with it. So Burlington is hurting, communities all over this country are hurting. Let me take a moment to tell you about what we did try to do. What we did try to do about those things. During the COVID pandemic, you all remember that the economy really collapsed. Small businesses went up. Uh, unemployment went soaring. Do you remember a plan called the American Rescue Plan? How many of you got checks for 1,400 bucks? All right. If you were unemployed during that time, your unemployment was extended. If you worked in the hospital, you know that the hospital got huge amounts of money because it was being flooded with people with COVID. Nobody knew how to deal with it. School systems got money. Child care centers got money. We expanded Medicaid because people lost their health insurance. As chairman of the budget committee, working with the president, we helped write that $1.9 trillion bill, which helped get this country out of the worst economic downturn in modern history. But that was not enough. What we wanted to do is come back and deal with some of the systemic and structural crises facing this country, including homelessness and housing and healthcare and drug addiction. We put together a massive bill that was unprecedented in modern American history that in fact would have dealt with hundreds of billions of dollars going into low-income and affordable housing, money going to helping addiction treatment. We don't have enough counselors by any means. We lost that vote in the Senate by two votes. So that fight has got to continue. Homelessness, crime, are serious problems, not only in Vermont, but all over this country. All right, maybe one more question. We got right here. Yeah. I'm Marilyn Alex, I live in Schaumburg. Uh, I'm a generation Vermonter, and I followed you for many years, Bernie. And uh, I just want to say all of these issues that have been brought up today seem to be very, very interconnected. Uh, we have a huge humanitarian 
problem in this country, first of all, in our borders, but how right now with the environmental issue, there are no, not going to be any crops to have to worry about because of forests and flooding. And all. I'm generally a, a very optimistic person, but I'm using that optimism because of complexity and the amount of problems that we're all experiencing. Yes. So I count my blessings living in Vermont, but I, I still see on the horizon that we're going to be facing a lot of more problems. How can we get all of us seniors together to try to solve some of these Good. issues as a committee and group? Well, look. Thank you very much for your question. You know, as I began my remarks by telling you, I wish I could tell you otherwise. These are the most difficult moments in your life, in my life. And that's the reality. Climate, democracy, crime, the, you know, the attacks on our very democratic foundations. People want to literally do away with democracy. All right, I'll tell you this. I had not thought. Does anybody know who Bill McKibben is? Does anybody mean anything? One, great. Bill is Liz Ripton. Uh, and Bill has been in the forefront of uh, climate change for 20 years. Taught me a lot about it. Way ahead of his time. And Bill has recently he organized a group called 350, which is a climate change group. Now you know what he's doing. He has a great idea. He understands that many of you, senior citizens, you are passionately concerned about these issues that we're talking about. Many of you are retired. You want to do meaningful things with your lives, right? You don't want to sit around watching tube all day. And he is trying to organize seniors into a powerful political force to do just that. And let me get back, you know, we have, any of you get the burning buzz? You ever see that burning buzz? All right, we send that out on a regular basis. And check it out, there's a lot of good stuff in it. Uh, and we will communicate with you about how you are a powerful force. And if we don't want billionaires to have all the power, then the antidote is you and the young people and everybody else going to stand up and fight back. So we will work to try to do what we can with Bill to mobilize seniors around the issues that we're talking about. All right, let me just. Third Act. Okay. Uh, let me just again uh, thank uh, all of you for being here. Uh, let me thank the Green Mountain. Uh, Meg's Chorus, let me thank Bob and Brenda Sample uh, for their catering to the event. Joe Tangway uh, at the uh, Hilton right here for his help. And now I think we're going to turn the mic back to the Green Mountain Men's Chorus. Gentlemen, take away.